with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts at chapter number 9. Verses 1 through verse number 9. And I want to preach from the subject from persecutor to proclaimer. Call Paul, who was then Saul, becomes the saged, the apostle Paul. He goes from a persecutor to a proclaimer. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Thank you. You may have your seats. <coughs> the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. From persecutor to proclaimer. The beginning chapters of book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles is primarily spotlighting or highlighting the life and ministry of Peter. Peter is the apostle to the Jews. Peter is given much press in the opening chapters of the book of Acts. It is Peter on the day of Pentecost who preaches and 3,000 are added to the church. It is Peter, along with John, who go in Acts chapter 3 up to the temple at the hour of prayer. And there is this man on the outside of the gate begging. And it is Peter who says to him, silver and gold, have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It is Peter, when they are brought before the magistrates, they are brought before the Sanhedrin, and they are instructed to preach no more in the name of Jesus Christ. It is Peter who responds to the Sanhedrin council and says to them, we cannot but speak the things that we have both seen and heard.
Peter is prominent in the opening chapters of the book of Acts because he is the apostle to the Jews. But in chapter 9, after Stephen is stoned in chapter 8, and that chapter closes with Paul holding the garments of Stephen as he is being stoned to death, there is now a transition from Peter, who is apostle to the Jew, to Paul, who is the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter is unlearned and ignorant. Paul is a student of Gamaliel. Peter is untrained. Paul is trained as a Pharisee. Peter is a rugged fisherman. Paul is a Jew by birth, a Roman by citizenship, a tent maker by trade, and a lawyer by profession. He's a Pharisee by religious training, circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul is steeped in religious tradition, while Peter is an itinerant preacher. Peter is rough around the edges, while Paul is trained in rhetoric. Peter is an unlearned fisherman. Paul is a trained theologian. But just like Jesus saved Peter, Jesus saves Paul. Now, brothers and sisters, Saul, who becomes Paul, was an intellectual giant, far-sighted enough to see that there could be no peaceful coexistence between militant Judaism and militant Christianity. Either Judaism was right and Christianity was apostasy or Christianity was right and Judaism was obsolete. Saul's birth, his beliefs, and his background all drove him into a head-on confrontation with the religion of Jesus Christ. His giant intellect, his fierce emotions, and his iron will all fused together in determined hatred of those people of the way. And any time a man is possessed of giant intellect, fierce emotions, iron will, only Jesus can transform him. Let me see if I can make that make sense. Uh, that Ethiopian eunuch was easy to convert, uh, and Philip had no problem leading him to Christ because he was reading the prophecy of Isaiah. I wish I had a Bible reader. And the Holy Spirit joined Philip to his chariot, and Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I except some man guide me? And Philip instructs him about the ways of God, and the man is instantly converted, and he says to Philip, here is some water. What's keeping me from being baptized? In Acts chapter 10, when the Holy Ghost came to the home of Cornelius, by the time Peter got there to preach, the Holy Ghost had already softened their hearts and when Peter preached, the same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost fell in the home of Cornelius, and they were easily converted. But Saul had a giant intellect, 
fierce emotion and an iron will. And those three together make a man hard to convert. So this is a job not for Philip. Not for Peter at the home of Cornelius. This is a job for Jesus himself. And brothers and sisters, some of us in here this morning can testify that my sins were so bad. I wish I had somebody to help me here. I was so lost. My mother had been praying for me. My family had been asking God to save me. But I was on my way to hell and a preacher couldn't do it. A deacon couldn't do it. A choir couldn't do it. Jesus himself had to arrest me on my way to hell. Now listen. If, 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 your, if your reputation ain't that bad, you can't shout on the gospel. I wish I had a witness here. If you haven't done stuff that you're ashamed to talk about, you can't shout on the message of the gospel. But if you got some sins that you don't want nobody to know about, if you got some skeletons in your closet, and if the door would open, you'd have to crawl out of here right now, then the message of the gospel sets your heart on fire because God will forgive you no matter how low you sink. And listen. Uh, uh, when you sit in church with a giant intellect and a fierce emotion and an iron will saying, preacher, I don't care what you say, I will not be moved. I can't move you. But I know somebody who can stop you in your tracks. Somebody ought to help me. I know somebody who can take that smirk off your face. I know somebody who knows how to put you back in your place. Is there anybody here? I said, is there anybody here? Know that you are no match for the power of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The worst sinner in here is no match for God. I think I ought to rush and tell you God has until right now to meet his match. They're on their way to Damascus, the oldest city in the world. Paul, who is then Saul, is on his way to Damascus with letters of authority from the Sanhedrin to arrest men or women, people of the way. Because he has a bitter hatred for Jesus Christ. And he hates Jesus for the same reason that he came to love him. He hates him because he hung on a cross. But he loves him because he hung on the cross. Somebody ought to help me preach it. He hates him because the Bible says in the Old Testament, cursed is he that hangs on a tree. I wish I had a Bible reader. But when you read the book of Ephesians, we were dead in trespasses and sins. That's Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. And Paul says he died on the cross. And then Colossians says he took the handwritten ordinances that were against us and nailed them to the cross. The same reason he hated him is the same reason he loved him. 
And some of us in here can testify to that. We used to play church. We used to act like we were shouting. Come on, talk back to me here. I'm talking, I'm talking to folk who were raised in church. You used to watch them old people shouting and praising God, and you laughed at that. You thought that was funny. You thought that was foolish. And then you'd go get you some Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill and go to the club or, or go to a dance and party and then go to church and sleep all during the service. And then somebody would start shouting and you wake up and start laughing and then go home and act like what you saw them doing at church. You hated when your mama made you go to Sunday school, made you go to BYPU, made you go to Baptist Training Union, made, no matter how late you stayed up at night, they made you go to church on Sunday morning. And you hated that. But now the same reason you hated it is the reason you love it. Because if you had not had that experience, you wouldn't have your salvation. I'm, I'm, I'm no longer, I'm no longer shouting like I saw somebody else shout. I'm no longer raising my hands like I saw my mama doing. I've been through enough on my own. God's been good to me. God has opened doors for me. God has shown me some things that I would not have seen had God not been in my life. And so I don't need nobody else to show me how to praise God. I don't need nobody to teach me how to praise God. When I think about the goodness of Jesus, when I muse over where God has brought me from, I don't need to be in church. It doesn't have to be Sunday morning. I don't need the choir to get me excited. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Now, the choir just got through talking to us about grace. And there's something about God's grace. And it's fortuitous that they sang that song. Because that falls right in line with what I want to tell you grace did in the life of the Apostle Paul. The grace of God claimed him. Now listen to me, sisters and brothers. It's hard for God to miss you if he really wants to get his hands on you. Don't, 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 don't think you're hiding in this crowd. And God does not individually know your situation. Your curriculum vitae is no surprise to God. He made you. He's numbered every hair on your head. He knows your thoughts even before you think them. He knows you're down sitting. He knows you're uprising, and there's really no place you can go that he can't find you. The psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I go to the utmost parts of the earth, you're there. So you think God don't see you on the third pew at Lily Grove? You think God don't know you in the overflow? You think God is surprised that you're in the balcony? He woke you up this morning. He watched over you all last night. He's been keeping you even when you wouldn't acknowledge he was keeping you. And if he wants to claim you, ain't nothing you can do about it. He says, Saul, Saul, watch this. I want you to get this. Why are you persecuting me? I want you to get this. Saul, 
is on the way to destroy the church. But Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? You missed that. Paul is threatening to slaughter the church. But Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? I still don't think I got that over to you. Paul is on his way to destroy the church, but Jesus calls the church me. There is no church without Jesus. Upon this rock, I wish I had a Bible reader. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Paul is on his way to destroy the church, but Jesus said, on your way, think about this. When you get there, you're going to run into me. And I want to tell somebody who's been talking bad about the church and talking bad about the pastor and talking bad about the members and them people ain't nothing but phonies and <clears throat> that's why I don't go there because they fake. Be careful. Because Jesus said when you run into this church, you're going to bump into me. And it's hard for you to kick against the priest. Uh, the grace of God claimed because when Jesus said Saul why are you persecuting me Paul says Lord who are you he never said that before but but his giant intellect, his fierce emotion, his iron will is on the ground. Because when that light shined on him, it knocked him off his beast. And let me tell you, giant intellect, let me tell you, fierce emotional one, let me tell you, strong, iron-willed one in here, God knows how to put that in the dust. I still don't think I'm helping you. Once he claims you, he changes you. Paul had never called Jesus Lord. Until he got knocked off his beast. And God knows how to send something your way. To put your pride in the dust. Somebody ought to help me preach it. God knows how to humble you. That you'll get up saying, Lord. What will you have me to do? I wish I had a witness here. Just keep sitting here with your mouth closed. Just keep sitting here acting like you don't know who I'm talking about. You're all dressed up and your face is all pretty and made up. And you got money in the bank and you got keys to a nice house. And you're driving a fine car and you got a big paying job in the morning. But God can put all of that in the dust. Somebody ought to help me preach it. That's why you ought to come on here and praise God with everything you have. Because if he decides to take it all from me in the morning... I still got my salvation. I still got my peace. I still got my joy. Because who I am is not wrapped up in what I have. Yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to appeal to some stubborn person in here. Bigger than you have been knocked to the dust. You're going to help me preach this, won't you? 
All it takes is a moment and life can change. Kansas City was winning by four touchdowns. But them boys got the momentum. Somebody ought to help me preach it. And it was all over with. There was one second on the clock that Nick Saban insisted they put on the clock for Alabama. But Auburn turned that thing around when he kicked that field goal and missed and that Auburn player caught it and ran all the way into the end zone to defeat Alabama, the Crimson Tide, in one second. All it takes is a moment and life can change for you. You walked in here this morning, but all it takes is a moment and you can be in the intensive care unit. You woke up on your own strength this morning, but all it takes is a moment and you can have a brain aneurysm. You fed yourself this morning, but all it takes is a moment and somebody's got to bathe you tonight. God knows how to put it in the dust. Grace claimed his life. Grace changed his life. Well, let's not hold you too long. Grace completed his life. Look what the text said. Paul says, Lord, what do you want me to do? And here is what Jesus told him. He said, go where you plan. Keep on going where you started. You, you have to read the rest of the text to hear me. He says, and when you get there, somebody that I have already appointed will show you what I want you to do. Now, Jesus could have told him himself. But he said, I got a preacher on Straight Street named Ananias who will tell you what I want you to do. I wish I had somebody to help me. I want to say to you folk who are getting these revelations, this rhema word that, that, that the Lord is speaking to you directly and you don't have to go to church and you don't have to hear no preacher, that's a lie. Because the Lord Jesus could have told Paul himself what to do. But he said, go to Straight Street. I got a preacher there who will give you instruction. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Wish I had a witness. How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? But don't leave the verse right there. It goes on to say, but how shall they preach except they be sin? Anybody can't preach to me. My spiritual antenna is too sensitive to let anybody preach to me. If you're not preaching Jesus, I don't want to hear nothing you got to say. Because prosperity is not going to get me to heaven. Naming it and claiming it is not going to save me. I need to hear a preacher point me to Jesus. I wish I, had, I wish I had time to stay right there. But here's how the Holy Ghost completes it. He's on his way to Straight Street. But before he gets there, the word tells us something that we ought not run over real quickly. The men who were with him, they were standing there gazing. 
That word gazing in the text is the same word in the English for theater. They were watching as if looking at a play or a movie in a theater. Their eyes were open, but the scripture says they couldn't see anything. Their eyes were open, but they couldn't see anything. Paul was blind, but he saw everything. I wish I had somebody to help. That's the way the Holy Ghost completes the process of salvation. First, he got to claim you. Then he has to change you. And then he shows you some things blind that you couldn't see with your eyes open. Let me see if I can make that make sense. The gospel is preached to a hundred people. One person will hear it and be saved. The gospel preached to the same hundred, only one heard it. Because God wanted only that one to be saved. For reasons that only God knows in eternity past, some people will hear it and be saved. Other folk will hear it and go to hell. On the pew where you sit, the word of God is being preached to everybody in this room. Some folks' hearts are being warmed. Some people are getting mad. Some people's spirits are being quickened. Other folks are getting upset. Because the sun, S-U-N, shines on mud and clay. It hardens one softens the other. The sun, S-O-N, shines on everybody in this church. He will harden one and soften the other. You want to know the hard ones from the soft ones? I'm glad you asked. Because every time I said the name Jesus, their eyes brightened. Every time I mentioned the name Christ, their spirits came alive. Every time I talked about what God will do through the Holy Spirit in salvation, they almost jumped out of their seats because they came here this morning under the life-changing influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Have I got a witness here? And every time they hear the name Jesus, they almost jump out of their clothes. Because they know him and he knows them. You're going to help me preach this, won't you? You've been sitting around some folk. Don't look at them now because they're going to know you're looking at them. But you've been sitting around some folk all the morning. They haven't smiled. They haven't clapped their hands. They haven't gotten into the worship. Because they are hard-hearted, stubborn, and recalcitrant. Don't worry with them. Don't get mad at them. They just don't know any better. They don't have it like you have it. They haven't been claimed like you've been claimed. They haven't been changed like you've been changed. So you ought not be upset with folk when they're dead. Because when you're dead, you don't know anything. You can't get mad with a dead person for not shouting. Because they are dead. Have I got a witness here? But those of us who have been made alive by the spirit of the living God, you know when you hear the name Jesus, something strange is about to happen. When you hear the name Jesus, lives will be changed. Direction will be changed. Devotion will be changed. Defiance will be turned into gratitude. Unhappiness will be turned into joy. Because the choir told her there's something about God's grace. His grace woke me up this morning. His grace started me on my way. 
His grace gives me peace in the midst of my storm. His grace helps me to hold on when I don't have the answer. His grace gives me understanding when I don't know what's going on around me. His grace walks with me in my dark valley. His grace helps me shake hands with folk who can't speak to me. His grace helps me to love members of my family who don't even know who Jesus is. His grace helps me to shout on Sunday morning. But it ain't got to be Sunday morning. When I think about it on Thursday morning, I get happy on Friday morning because it was nobody but Jesus. I wish I had some shouters here. I wish I had some praises here who's been changed by the Holy Spirit. If the Lord opened doors for you, help me magnify his name. If the Lord arrested you on your Damascus road, help me magnify his name. If the Lord got you off of drugs, took the taste of alcohol from you, Stop you from being out all night and made the word of God alive in your life. Why don't you grab somebody? Why don't you hug somebody? Tell them his word is a light to my feet. His word is a light on my pathway. His word gives me real joy. 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 Joy, shake somebody's hand. Tell them this joy that I have, the world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. Has he brought you? Has he saved you? Has he claimed you? Has he changed you? Has he completed you? Then help me pray this name. Jesus. The Son of God, he died, didn't he die? But bright and early, Sunday morning, he got up from the grave with all power, all power, all power. I know he's all right. I know I got to leave it alone here. I know we got to move on in the service here. But he walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I am his own. And the joy, the joy, the joy we share as we tarry, none other has ever known. Do you have joy? I'm not talking about stuff. Do you have joy? I'm not talking about a bank account. Do you have joy? I'm not talking about good health now. Do you have joy? If you got it and you're not embarrassed, if you got it and you don't care who's looking at you, grab somebody, tell them I got it. I got it, I, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it because he gave it to me, I got it, I know he's all right. And Ananias said, after God told him to go down the straight street, Paul.
Paul is, is waiting on you. And Ananias said, Lord, wait a minute. I've heard a bad report. I've, I've heard about this man's reputation. The Lord said, don't be scared to go there now. That's what he used to be. He's no longer persecuting Saul. He's proclaiming Paul. Don't worry about him now. I've turned him from a persecutor to a proclaimer. You can talk to him now. He got good sense now. You can talk to him now. He's praying now. And when Ananias went in that house, he put his hand on it. And the Bible says the Holy Ghost came on Saul. And scales fell from his eyes. And he couldn't see a minute ago, but now he can see. I was blind. But since I met Jesus, now, I can see. Isn't it amazing what you can see with your eyes closed? Isn't it wonderful what God can show you when you can't see? If I had had the sense in my 20s that I have in my 50s, I would be almost superhuman. Well, thank God I found Jesus, or rather, he found me and saved me, claimed me, changed me, and completed me.